Very good. Good evening, and God bless each one of you. It's good to be with you here tonight. And we'll get all of our electronics working here first. Let me see. Did that come up right? Not yet. Good evening and welcome to each one of you. It's good to be with you here tonight in Ohio. I think I'm in Ohio. I kind of got confused there somewhere today crossing state lines and maybe I'm a little bit tired, but I think it's gonna be a good time. I'm looking forward to uh, being here and, and just sharing with each one of you and hearing, uh, hearing from your hearts too. Can we, can we sing that, that song together, a verse of that song? Come, gracious Spirit, heavenly dove, with light and comfort from above, be now our guardian, thou our guide, o'er every thought and step reside, o'er every thought. Amen. Maybe I should have looked at what hymn books to use before I start songs. I look at those, I'll know a little bit more what songs are in it. But yeah, looking forward to uh, to being with you here this this weekend. And and I thought when when the brother was talking here and when he was praying, I thought you know to start out with tonight. I would just like to make a couple of really basic statements. And the first one is, God is right. God is right. God has never been wrong. He doesn't know how to be wrong. He's never learned anything. God is right. And God's word is the truth. Amen? Amen? And the possibility of his word being wrong doesn't exist. I was reading the other day some foolishness somewhere, I forget where it was at. <clears throat> this guy is saying that we need to teach people to anchor their faith in the resurrection not in the Bible. And I thought to myself, who thought that up? What spirit do you think raised Jesus Christ from the dead? Hello? What spirit do you think wrote this book? Are they fighting? Because from where I stand, it looks like the same spirit, amen? And the Bible talks about us being born again by the word of God. <laughs> and that word lives and abides forever. Amen? Amen. And God's right. And it's just, it's one of the most um, uh, exciting and relaxing, if you want to put it that way, things in the world is to open your Bible and read because you don't have to sort through it. You don't have to sit there and wonder, is this really true or is this fake news? You don't have to work, you don't have to sort through it. It is all the truth, amen. amen. We may not always understand it, but it's all the truth, amen? <coughs> when was the last time God was wrong? He's never been wrong, amen? amen? So what ends up happening, if I take one way and God takes another way, which one of us is wrong? That would be me, amen? So I just thought I would start out with that tonight that that God is right. And we want to be looking into his word a bunch here tonight and looking at some things on the hope of glory and Christ in you. The, the first one I have there, 1 Corinthians 2, 1, Paul said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. What do you think that means? 
If you were going to walk into a place where people did not know the gospel, into a city that was completely dark, nobody there knew anything about the gospel, and when you left two years later, you would say, I did not know anything among you but Jesus Christ and him crucified. What does that mean? What were you actually saying? For two years, what were you saying? You're just walking around saying, Jesus Christ is crucified, Jesus Christ is crucified. You think that's what was happening? What is he saying when he says, I determined not to know anything among you but Jesus Christ and him crucified? Now, while you're kind of thinking about that a little bit, I, I am going to introduce a little bit of who I am. My name is Steve Stutzman. It's not important. Um, most uh, people, or a lot of people, I suppose, that are somewhat familiar with us, with our family, with Stutzman family, would know us a lot by our music and by the, the singing and stuff that we've done over the years. <clears throat> the first recording that we made was 30 years ago. That makes me feel old. Because half the people in the room aren't even that old yet, anyway. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna give you a rough overview, a little bit of how I ended up where I'm at, I guess. So maybe it'll make more sense to you why I come across the way I do, or or where I'm at with things. I was. Um, uh, raised in Iowa on a cornfield, so when I get out here and see all these flat cornfields, that feels pretty much at home. The roads are straight. I like that. Um, I feel pretty much at home in a place like that. Grew up there. And at about four or five years old, my dad had, had been involved in a number of different things outside of the country. And about five years old, he first took us out of the country into Central America. When I was six years old, we went down, uh, and this is 1973, and we went down to southern uh, end of Belize. So we drove all the way to Texas, across Mexico, the long way, all the way down to the other end, into Belize, and then all the way to the bottom end of Belize. And we got back to the end of the road. There's no more road. Uh, and about seven miles from the end of the road there was a little village called Blue Creek. And we camped in that village in a camper. My mom and dad and eight of us children. There's 10 children, eight of us were along, and we camped there in an open air thatch roof hut uh, with a, with a pickup and camper. Uh, there, we stayed there for about three months. And so every night when we were there in this little village, <coughs> um, the people would come. Uh, for many of them, we were like, they were not that familiar with white people at all. So. When we came in there, they'd come and gather around and they'd watch us eat. And they, some of them had not seen a fork before. They didn't, you know, like, how do you eat with a fork? And it was all kind of a new experience for them and for us. And we're, uh, my mom washing the clothes out on a rock in a river. And, and uh, we were, I think, um, seven miles away from the closest refrigerator and an hour away from the closest telephone. <coughs> Just to give you an idea of kind of where we were at back in the bush. There was no electric around there, and nobody had refrigeration. So it was it was an interesting experience. During that time, uh, we would you know we'd go to bed at night, and my dad would sit down at the picnic table with the local men there in the village, and he would start talking to them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And after a number of weeks of that, some of these men began to cry. They would come there and they would sit down, and they would cry, and they would say. I remember the one man kept telling my dad, you're telling us the truth. You're telling us the truth. I know that you're telling us the truth. I've never heard this before, but I know it's the truth. And one at a time, these people began to believe, and they would weep before God, and they would repent of their sins, and something would turn inside of them. And the next night, they'd come back with their wife and a couple of their friends, and one at a time, they're sitting there turning to Christ. And it was, it was an amazing thing to watch as a little boy. I was six years old. We left that village to go back home to Iowa um, because it was coming up on harvest time. Uh, and we had a farm there. My dad had a farm and a business, a couple of businesses. And he wanted to get back home to the two adult boys that were there and help them with that. Plus, it was time for me to start school. So we were headed back through Mexico to get home. 
and we're driving all day and all night and all day and all night, and somewhere there in Mexico, when we were driving along in the middle of the night, in 1973, we ran into the back of a lumber truck that was parked on the road. No lights or flares or anything, and there was oncoming traffic. My brother couldn't see, he was driving with a glare in his eyes, and he uh, slid the, you know, locked up the brakes and slid into the back of this lumber truck. Uh, horrible accident, and <clears throat> shredded the front of the pickup and camper, and in that accident, my mother and one teenage brother and my little baby sister were all killed. And I was laying there, six years old, on the bed up over the cab, and the first thing that I remember seeing was my little sister laying there with her head split open. Um, the next day, in Villahermosa, Mexico, southern Mexico, we buried three bodies in a lonely Catholic cemetery in Villahermosa, Mexico. Came back home eventually when we, some of them were in the hospital. One sister had a broken neck. Um, we came back home and uh, I started to school and started going through life like that without a mom. Uh, and, and I could go into all kinds of things with all that, but. Um, 20 or 21 years old, I went to a Bible school out here in Ohio. I met a girl from Oregon. We got married. We started through our life together. Not long before we were married, she lost her mind and began to be somebody who some days would be okay mentally and some days would be so far gone that she didn't even know her own name. And it was back and forth like that, and this is before we're married. And that kind of started a stormy chapter in our life. She ended up on all kinds of medication. We were going to doctors and psychiatrists and all this and that. And couldn't find answers for what was going on. And then um, again, fast forward a couple years, we have several children. We're trying to learn how to cope with life in this sort of a fashion. And somebody came around. This is all, by the way, in a conservative Mennonite church. The church I grew up in had been very much like this. Only it was conservative Mennonite church, not a Dunkard Brethren or whatever, Brethren in Christ. It was a, it was a Mennonite church. Um, somebody came around and began to propose to us the idea that there are things in our life that we need to repent of. There are things that people do that follow them through life that they need to repent of. And we sat down with them and started going through a bunch of stuff and we ended up repenting uh, in ways that I didn't really understand anything about. Somebody led us through repentance time, prayed over my wife, and she was completely set free in one day. Walked away from that whole thing, all the mental disturbances. People would come to me and tell me, your wife's laying downstairs in the basement, passed out on the floor at church. I would pick her up and carry her out to the car. Like I, to the doctors and the psychiatrists, and I have been there and done that and bought a t-shirt and went home. Like I. You, you got to tell me something new, right? Like I was through all that stuff. And all of a sudden, just in one day, she was completely set free and delivered of it, and we walked away from that thing. It took us three days to realize that this thing was gone, was never going to come back. And it, it really turned my world on its head. And um, it, was, it was in that experience that God began to speak so clearly into my spirit and, and the Bible just opened up as a brand new book and I'm like, ah, this God is alive and he wants to communicate with us today and he wants to talk to us today and he wants to do things with us today and, and out of that, um, I, was, I was hauling corn, believe it or not, I was going down the road with 800 bushels of corn behind me on the way back from the combine and, and well, I had been, I thought something was wrong with the elevator. I thought there was a bearing going out. I kept hearing this noise. And I, it took me, I had how many trips up and down the elevator shaft there to figure out that it actually was not a problem with a bearing. The noise was in my head. <laughs> and it was a tune. It was a tune to a song. And I went home and I sat down for lunch and I, instead of eating, I wrote the words out to the song. And I got done and I'm like, honey, I just wrote a song. Look at this. And then I forgot the melody. <laughs> So I went back out and was driving down the road in the afternoon with corn behind me and I, I was wise enough to put a pen and a tablet in my pocket 
And I remember where I was at when all of a sudden that, that melody came back. And I reached over and slapped the throttle back and I turned the radio off. The guy in the combine could just wait. And I sat there and I wrote down <laughs> the melody to the song. Um, and so that was the first song that we had. And then it was, it was because of that. Uh, my wife started to get songs and we're sitting there writing songs, but nobody knows them. Nobody knows the songs. So we decided, well, we need to record these songs. Some of these are pretty good. We need to record them. So we went to a sound studio, and we started recording these songs, and they started selling. The recordings started selling all over the place. So we made another one. Then we made another one. And our little girls are growing up. They're just wee little dippers. And, uh, and somehow or another, I, I don't remember what all happened, how it all happened, but we took them into a prison. And these little girls started singing in a prison. And we'd sing at home, and we'd teach them Bible verses, and they went into a prison, and they started doing this, and the place just came unglued. Guys are jumping up and down, crying, wolf whistling. They're just, they're all messed up. There weren't very Mennonite, you know, in the prison. But, <clears throat> so they're j jumping up and down, shouting, carrying on. And, and uh, I started seeing how much impact little children had on prisoners. So we started going into more prisons, and through that, we ended up connecting with Gospel Express and making more recordings and running around singing with them. And then we did that for a number of years, got into counseling because people were coming for answers. And then because of that, we ended up going down to Door of Hope and starting seminars with them. And after about 10 years of that, we uh, left there. They actually asked us to go and start our own ministry. So we still work with Door of Hope. We still work with Gospel Express. But we have a ministry called Straight Paths Foundation, and uh, was started in 2010, and we operate that um, in wherever God takes us. <clears throat> so that's a little bit of my journey, how I got to where I'm at, why I'm doing what I'm doing. I had a business until 2007. I could not uh, keep up with my life. I couldn't do the counseling and the seminars and the singing and the ministry and everything that was happening and still run a business. And so we sat down and looked at it, and we prayed about it, and we sold the business and walked away from it. And uh, so since then, since 2007, we've been in full-time ministry. I put this verse up here. Um, it, was on, it was on one of my slides, and so I, I thought I'd throw it up there. <clears throat> that, that bottom part, you can't read, <laughs> but it is Arabic, and it is actually read from this side to that side. It's read right to left instead of left to right. And uh, I don't know what it says either, except for I just go to a side-by-side -side English and Arabic Bible, and I highlight it and copy it and paste it. And the reason I had done that is because over the years, and in, in, we'll get into more of that a little bit later, uh, we ended up uh, working with a number of mission organizations, and through that ended up trying to get involved in a bunch of stuff that's going on in the Middle East. So I ended up doing some speaking in the Middle East to some church leaders and whatever over there. And everything had to be translated into Arabic, so I put it on my slides. <laughs> I just thought that would be interesting to me. Um, that's the only Arabic you're going to see here this evening. That give you a little bit of an idea of where I'm going to and, and where I'm coming from with this, and hopefully helps you to understand a little bit of what you hear from me tonight and uh, tomorrow and from my wife tomorrow, why uh, we look at things the way that we do, why we are passionate about what is going on the way that we are. So <clears throat> it doesn't, it's not academic. It's not something I went to school to study. It's not something I look for in my life or that I tried to do or wanted to do. When I grew up driving a tractor back and forth across the cornfield, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to drive a tractor back and forth across the cornfield. I liked it. But it's not what I'm doing. So God has uh, ideas about where he wants us to go, what he wants us to do. And we just want to go along with it. Amen? Okay, so back to this thing of I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
In Colossians 1.27, which is where we're going to be going tonight, we're going to be talking a little bit this week, kind of the theme of the week is the hope of glory. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So I want to start out here tonight with a question. What's Christianity? If somebody comes and asks you, what's Christianity, what do you tell them? If somebody came into your church here on Sunday morning, and they sat here and listened to what you're saying, and then halfway through, they would come walking down the aisle up here, and they'd kneel down up here and be sobbing, what would you tell them? We live in a confusing world. A week and a half ago, I was in the country of Jordan. Two weeks ago, I was in the country of Jordan. And our tour guide in Jordan was a Muslim. We're driving down the road through the desert there one day, and he turns to me and says, are all the people in your bus Catholic? And I, how would you answer that? This is a Muslim asking, are all the people in your bus Catholic? Well, not exactly. I said they, they'd probably line up more with the whole idea of, because uh, see, we, had, we actually had people in our bus that were Dunkard Brethren. We had people there that were Amish. We had people there that were Russian Mennonite. And we had people there that were Mennonite. And we had some people there that were Beechy. So what do you tell him? Well, we probably line up a little bit more with Protestant than with Catholic. He's a Muslim. He doesn't know what that means. So he starts asking questions. What does this mean? <coughs> well, we're driving through the desert. There's nothing to see out there but sand and stones. There aren't even goats out there. I mean, there was nothing out. So I said, can I talk to you a little bit? And he said, sure. So I went and sat down beside him, and I said, now, <laughs> we're going to have a conversation. And in this conversation, you are not the tour guide. We're just friends. I just want to talk as friends. Because I understand that, that when, he's, when he's on the clock doing his job, there's certain things he can say and certain things he can't say, right? And I don't want that to happen. So I'm saying, right now, we're just friends. We're talking a little bit. <clears throat> and um, I said, I'm going to go back and start at the beginning. So I went back to the time of Jesus Christ and I'm talking about the church and the early church and what happened the first 300 years. And he interrupted me. <laughs> he interrupted me. And he said, I want to ask you a question as a friend. And I said, OK, fire. What, what do you want to ask? And he said, what do you think of the idea of two guys getting married to each other? <laughs> now, he just got done asking me if we're Catholic. I'm talking to him about early church history, early church history, yeah. And he says, what do you think of the idea of two guys getting married together? Does anybody know what was going through his mind? Do you have any idea what was going through his mind? Yeah, you know, this doesn't have to be like a church service. Answer me. What do you think was going through his mind? What is being portrayed to the people in the Muslim world is that this is what Christianity believes. So I told him, well, <clears throat> OK. <laughs> First of all, it's stupid. Beyond that, it's wrong. And God doesn't want anything to do with it. Do you have any other questions? <laughs> and he's like, oh, well. 
That's kind of what he thought too. So then we went back to the early church. <laughs> we go through this thing of the early church. <clears throat> we talk about what happened with Constantine and how the whole thing became a militarized Catholic church and how that divided between Eastern Orthodox and Orthodox. These people are all somewhat familiar with this, with this thing, right? And he interrupted me again. You know what he said? This is a Muslim guy. You know what he said? He said, I do not reject the, 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 the first 300 years of Christian church. I don't reject that. He said they were right. I'm not sure I've recovered from that statement yet. That's a Muslim talking. So we went up through the, to the Reformation. I was talking about the, the Catholic and the Protestant and then how the Anabaptists came out of that whole thing and all that. And then I was telling him that these people don't, they don't fight, they don't take up arms, they don't join the military, they, they don't go. And he said, well, what if somebody comes to kill them? And I said, they die. And he just stared at me. He said, they won't fight? And I said, no, they won't fight. They will love you, and they will die. And he looks back at the bus, and he says, everybody in the bus is like that? Everybody in the bus is like that. My wife got a picture of him about that time, and he was almost in tears. He's like, I've never even heard of this. I didn't know it existed on the earth today. So I'm going back to my question. What's Christianity? What does it mean to you? If somebody says, I'm a Christian, or if somebody wants to be a Christian, what does it mean? We say, well, if you want to be a Christian, you got to be born again, right? You must be born again. Well, what does it mean to be born again? What does it actually mean? What does it truly mean to be born again? What does that mean? This man <clears throat> took a tree, and as it was growing up, he bent it. He bent the branches in a certain way, and he tied them there with twines. And then when the tree got a little bit older, he bent the branches another way, and he tied them with twines. And he tied those branches in a certain position so that when the tree eventually got to be more mature, you could take all the twines off and the tree would just sit there like that. And he had a... It seems to me like a lot of times that's a little bit the idea that we have of Christianity. That we will take our children and we will teach them how to walk, and we'll teach them how to sit, we'll teach them how to stand, we'll teach them what words to use and what words not to use, we'll teach them what's right and what's wrong, and we will tie them in that position, and when they get a little bit older we can take the twines off and they'll be a cherry tree. But what is Christianity? And what does it actually mean to be a Christian? Colossians 1.25. I'm going to read a number of verses here in Colossians chapter 1. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, 
to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I don't know how many times in there God uses the word mystery. What is a mystery? What is a mystery? If you're going to read a mystery book, uh, maybe when children are in school, and these days they don't read books, I don't know, but when I was in school, it was the Hardy Boys. <laughs> mystery book and there's always some kind of a mystery going on that you're trying to figure out what's happening behind the scenes right and here he says there is a mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ and all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hid in that mystery and if you go back a little bit he says the mystery has been hid from ages and from generations but now is made manifest. It was hidden, but now is made manifest. And then he starts talking about glory. <clears throat> to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Do you know what the word glory is actually representing here? What the concept of the word glory is, is, is to make something look good. And he says there, this riches is going to make God look good. It is a mystery that we preach, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So I'm going to go down here to this part here that says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This just gets me all wound up. I, I hope tonight before God that, that we can uh, um, make this, that, that this will be something that we can make plain enough that even a child can understand. Peter was walking down the road one day with Jesus. The disciples were walking down the road with Jesus and Jesus said, who do people say that I am? And so he said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're this, some say you're that. And Jesus said, who do you think I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ. Thou art the Christ. And there's a whole bunch of things, exchanges that happened there in, in uh, Matthew 16. I'm not going to go into that tonight. There's one place that it's recorded is in Matthew 16. But I want to ask you a question. When Peter made that remark to Jesus, he said, you are the Christ. What did the word Christ mean? You ever think about it when Jesus came to the earth, <clears throat> As a baby, he was known as Jesus of When he was 12 years old, he was known as Jesus of When he's 16 years old, he's known as Jesus of When he's 28 years old, he's known as Jesus of When he's 30 years old, he's taken out and baptized in this Jordan River, and the Spirit of God comes down to him like a dove, and he goes out into the wilderness, and he's out there for um, uh, 40 days, and he's tempted of the devil. When he comes back in, something has changed. And he goes to a wedding, and he turns water into wine. And he finds a blind man, he touches his eyes, and they're healed. He finds a, a beggar or somebody crippled and he touches their legs and they're healed. He, he goes to Lazarus and he looks at the tomb and says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus comes out. Something has changed. Something has dramatically changed. And one day in the middle of that, he asks somebody, who do you think I am? And they did not say Jesus of Nazareth. 
they said, you are the Christ. Now, most of the time, I think in today's world, all we think about when we think about Christ is we think about Jesus' last name. <laughs> that we all kind of have a last name, right? So, I, I don't know. I, what town are we close to here? Covington. Covington. And what else? What's that? Yeah. Bradford. So you've got Covington and Bradford, and I suppose that there's a boy in one town, and he's named John, and he becomes known as John of Covington. And the other guy, gets, he, he's known as John of Bradford, right? Because I don't know why so many people name their children John. I don't have a problem if your name's John. By the way, I don't do that well, that well with names. I recognize some faces, but names I do really bad with. But uh, supposing that these people, the, the name is, is John, that their mom named him John, their dad named him John, so we get John of Bradford and John of Covington. That works okay until there's two Johns in Covington. Now what are you going to do? Well, we're pretty creative people. I don't know about you. I grew up out there in Iowa in a little community there, not too far away from the Amish community. And in the Amish community, they had too many guys named Dan that got married to too many women named Fanny. And you couldn't even talk about Dan Fanny anymore because there was more than one Dan Fanny. Well, the one Dan was really good with his hands and he could fix pert near anything. So they got to calling him Handy Dan, and to this day, his wife is Handy Dan Fanny. <laughs> there you go. So we have ways of fixing these problems. We, we come up with all these words. So I suppose you, you have um, over here this one, this one John in Covington. Maybe there's a, a river that goes through there, and he builds a water wheel, and he puts a shaft on the water wheel, and the shaft goes around, turns a big old grindstone, and the grindstone grinds wheat into flour or corn into cornmeal or whatever. And so he becomes known as John the... You notice the word the in there? Jesus the Christ. John the Miller. Over here's another one. He has a blacksmith forge and he's sitting there, you know, pumping... Um, air onto this fire and coal fire to make it real hot, puts metal in there and he beats it into wagon wheels and horseshoes and he becomes known as John the... You pull the word the out and you now have John Smith. And over here you pull the word the out and you now have John Miller. Believe it or not, that's how you got your last name. If you go back a little ways, you can probably find out what that name actually meant. Because the name had a meaning somewhere. I landed in a plane one day in Zurich, Switzerland, and we got off of the plane and went through the immigration thing, got on a taxi, and we're leaving the airport, and I saw a barricade, like a construction barricade, and on the side it said, Stutz. Ah, I asked the taxi driver, what's that? He says, construction barricade. Not that. I mean, what's Stutz? He said, that's a construction company. I said, well, what does the word Stutz mean? And he said, it's a very steep hill. Oh, well, you drive around in Switzerland a little bit, you find out half the country's on end, you know. The whole country's like this. So we're driving out through the countryside. We, we went to a little church out in the mountains one day there, and I asked some of the people in the church, tell me, what is a Stutzmann? So they talked about it for themselves a little bit, and they said a Stutzmann would be the man that lives at the top of a Stutz. <laughs> okay, well, that makes sense. I said, what do you call the man that lives at the bottom of the Stutz? And they said, that would be Amstutz. Sure enough, if you look around, in, in, at least in our people, in the Mennonite people, you find that there are Stutzmanns and Amstutzmanns. So I suppose there were two Johns. One lived at the top of the hill, one lived at the bottom of the hill. And one becomes known as John the Stutzmann, and the other one becomes known as John the Amstutz. 
doesn't really matter. But here's something that I think actually matters quite a bit. What does the word Christ mean? I'm fascinated with the way that the Jewish people think. There are so many things about the, we just, we just got back from Israel on Monday night. There's so many things about the way the Jewish people think that just, uh, it, uh, it just always boggles me. The way that they look at scripture, the way that they look at God. They have this concept that out there somewhere, there's a place out there somewhere where there's a God. We don't really know where it's at, but somewhere out there, there's a God. And inside of that God, there's this element of life. When John talked about it in John chapter 1, he says it this way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now I want you to look up there at that, and, and forgive me for this, but for the, at that little red blob. It, they're looking, John's looking at that thing and saying, in the beginning was the Word. That's that red blob. And the Word was with God, and the Word was in fact God. So now are we talking about God, or are we talking about a Word? Well, it gets worse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same as in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. All of a sudden it went from a Word to a Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. Now it went from Word to a Him to life. And the life was the light of men. In just a couple of verses, he's looking at that thing, that, that red blob, and he's saying that red blob is the word of God, it's life, it's light, and it is God. Amen. They, and, and they have that concept that there's something like that inside of God, and God opened his mouth, and that thing came out, and creation happened. You follow that? That concept of there being a life inside of God, a red blob of life, if you please, inside of God, is a very firmly established concept in the Jewish mind. They have a word for it, by the way. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> you and I are made on planet Earth. We don't know for sure where we are. We are somewhere between the beginning of time and the end of time. We know there's a place out there that there is no time. We know there's a place out there that does not have a beginning and it has no end. That place out there that has no beginning and no end, we call it Eternity, amen? Out there in that realm of eternity is God, and inside of God is that red blob, which is Christ. Now, <clears throat> one day, God reaches down, and he pulls out that life. And he puts it inside of a girl. And the life becomes a baby. And she brings forth her firstborn son and lays him in a manger and called his name Jesus. I don't know what Mary knew. My, my daughter, one daughter, sings a song. Mary, did you know? Mary, did you know? And we sing, we sing another song. Um, Small and she held so tenderly Had made a dry path Through the mighty Red Sea The wonder 
of wonders. I don't know how much they knew. I don't know how much Mary knew. The Bible says she pondered these things in her heart. I don't know how much Simeon knew when they met him in the temple. But it seemed like people had an idea that this, Christ, this child that was born, this, this Jesus that was born, there's a few references to him being a Christ child and then silence. For 30 years, silence. He comes around and starts doing miracles and all of a sudden one day somebody looks at him and says, I know who you are. You are that red blob from outer space. And we don't understand in our culture and in our mindset that saying those words carried a death penalty. You did not walk around and say to somebody, you are the anointed life. That did not happen. Period. You realize that when they wrote that word, when the scribes would, were copying the book of Isaiah, and they would come to that word, they would literally go out and take a bath before they wrote the word. This was a very highly sacred thing. You did not trifle with it. And here was Peter saying, Thou art the Christ. Whew. Jesus said right away, Time out, dude. Don't tell people that. Don't say that. But it was true, wasn't it? Amen? And eventually, we came to know him as Jesus, the Christ of God. And then we pull out the the, and he's just known as Jesus. And farther on, you find it reversed, and he is called Christ Jesus, the Lord. Amen? I want you to isolate in your mind that word Christ and I want you to see that red thing out there. Because the word Christ means that red thing out there. Do you understand that? The reason that that's... <laughs> wow. Okay, so he came down to the earth and you know what happened. You, I don't need to tell you the rest of the story. We took him with wicked hands and we put him on a cross. Amen? When that life... And, and there's, there's so many things in here we could spend days on. You need to understand... When that life from outer space, that red blob, when that life of God comes down to the earth, the earth does not particularly like it. Hello? Creation likes it. <laughs> right? Remember when they're out on the water and Jesus looks at the storm and says, Peace be still, and everybody's, ah, Even the winds and the waves obey him. Well, hello, he made them. Amen? Amen? But the world, the fallen world, hates him and took him by wicked hands and crucified him and did not realize, even while they were doing it, that putting that cross there actually made a way for you and I to leave this earth and to be seated in Christ in heavenly places now. It's just the most fascinating thing. I, I'll go through this a little bit more in some more scriptures. But the idea, I, I want you to think about this. I wish I had a tissue. Does anybody have a tissue? I need a tissue. Here is a tissue. Thank you. <clears throat> Don't need to blow my nose. I need the tissue, okay? <clears throat> the whole idea that I am trying to present to you tonight is that Christianity, if somebody asks you what is Christianity, for the rest of your life, I want you to have this answer ready for them. Christianity is the God of heaven reaching into himself, pulling out his life, and putting it in your human flesh. This is the mystery that we preach, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. Amen. 
I just, I feel like there's so, I get perturbed. Because people say, well, you know, in our church, we wear this, or we wear that, or we go to church, we put off, we put money in the offering, we're, we're, I'm a deacon, I'm a pastor, I'm this, I'm that, whatever, we're, we're, we're part of this church, we're part of that church. Listen, I spent years, I spent seven years going in and out of prisons all over the country. <laughs> I go into prison and ask people, why should I believe you're a Christian? Well, what do you think they said? I'm better than he is. <laughs> it's like, you know, and I'm like, you're in jail. <laughs> well, one time we prayed for my mom and she was healed and got out of the hospital and the doctor said she's going to die. Well, hallelujah. I'm glad your mom was healed. Doesn't make you a Christian. If you put a dog in the garage and shut the door, how long does it have to be in there to become a car? Putting a dog in the, go in the garage is not going to make it a car. Amen? Putting a sinner in a church is not going to make him a Christian. What's going to make somebody a Christian is when the God of heaven reaches in and pulls his life out, which is Christ, and puts it inside your human flesh. This is the mystery that we preach, which is Christ in you. And God's not picky, by the way. He doesn't care how you were, where you were born, who you were born to, what color you are, what nation you're from, who your mom or your dad is. Whosoever will may come. Amen? Amen. And he says, I'm going to take my life and I'm going to put it inside of you. This is the mystery that we preach. You need to understand something today. The cross of Jesus Christ stands at the center of time and of eternity past and eternity future is the cross of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Irritates the bejeebers out of me when I go into museums today. I was in a museum the other day. I, just, I, I walked out. I was hot. I can't handle it. You go in there and it says, well, this happened 61,000 B.C.E. You know what BCE means? Before common era. Do you know what CE means? Common era. Do you know what it used to say when I was 18? BC, which meant, and AD, which meant, Ante Domingo or after Christ. You can change the letters all you want to, but you will not change the cross. And the God of heaven himself decided that if you are a Muslim, or if you are an atheist, or if you're a Chinese communist, or if you're a Christian, or if you're anybody else on the face of the earth, and you write a check today, you are going to date that check according to the cross of Jesus Christ. You don't have to like it, but you can't change it. Amen. Amen. Because that cross stands there, and you can't change it. All of eternity past and eternity future comes together at that cross. Amen? Wow. <laughs> now, you understand that people on the other side of the cross could not have that life inside of them. Isaiah, Abraham, Jeremiah, all those people in the Old Testament, David... All these people, the Bible would say the Spirit of God would come upon them, but it does not say he was in them because God could not take his life and put it inside of them because the blood had not yet been shed on the cross. That's why Jesus said about John the Baptist, among all who are born of women has never one risen greater than John the Baptist. Nevertheless, I say unto you, he which is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. What Jesus is saying is, right here's the cross. <laughs> and on this side of the cross over here, nobody can have the life of God inside of them. But over here on this side of the cross, anybody can that wants to. It is a mystery that hath been hidden from ages and from generations, 
but now is made manifest unto his saints. Amen. So don't lose sight of that. I beg of you. And in everything else that you do, we, we can sit around and we can talk about the brethren and the church of the brethren and the Mennonite and the Amish and the Beechi and the Russian Mennonites and the Hutterite. And you know, listen, I get into all these kind of different places and I don't have, I'm not going to sit here and have an argument with any of them. I'm really not. I go into all kinds of different places all the time. But I have a simple question. Because you are not, you will not find a church full of people that all agree with each other. Hello. You're not going to find, you're not going to convince everybody in the world that you're right. I, you're not going to. Amen? Amen? Can we at least agree on that? Amen. Okay. So therefore, it must have not been hugely important to God. Because he knew that at the beginning. So what was important to him? I just, I love learning from people from different backgrounds and different whatever, and I don't try to get people to leave their church and go to the next one. I just don't see a lot of value in it. But there's one thing that I want people to have really, really clear. That is, has God reached into himself, pulled out his life, and put it inside of your human body? Because if he has done that, then he has made you a new creation. Amen. Amen. And if he has not done that, you are as lost as a duck in the dark. I don't care if you got baptized three times backwards or forwards or five times. If God didn't put his life in you, you were just a really wet sinner. So my question to the guys in the prison would always be, Tell me, where was it in your life that God reached down and put his life inside of you? I have been so very privileged to be able to be, able to be with... Um, We'll talk more about it tomorrow night. But to be able to be with some of these people in today's world who are coming to Christ from the Muslim background. Are, are you aware right now that there are more Muslims that turn to Christ in the Middle East, as far as we can tell right now, there are more Muslims that have turned to Christ in the Middle East in the last 20 years than in the previous thousand years combined. That is mind boggling. And when you get around some of these people and you see what they're doing, you know that earthquake that just happened over there? Eight days after the earthquake, they pulled a little girl out of the, somebody sent me a video of her. I don't know if you guys saw this or not. They pulled a little girl out of the rubble and they were trying to give her something to eat because they figured she's going to be starving hungry. She's been trapped in there for eight days. And she said, oh, no, I was fine. She said, this guy would show up. <laughs> Dressed in white. And he'd give me something. not too difficult to lead that little girl to Christ, is it? She doesn't even know what she's saying. All she knows is that when she was trapped down there, a man showed up in white and would give her food.
God is on the move today. The brother was talking about revival. God is on the move today, and he wants to do things that the world has not seen for years, just like this thing that's happening with the Muslims. And he wants it to be clear that it is him that is doing it. Amen? It's not happening by a man. It's not of man. It is Jesus Christ and him crucified. It goes back to that cross. Amen? Because it was on that cross that the blood was shed. And I, I was going to bring it up here tonight, and I left it out there in the bus. I have a little balance scale. Just a little, bal you know those balance scales? Because on one side of the balance scale is our sins. And the only thing that will ever balance that scale is the blood of Jesus. There's nothing else that will ever balance that scale. Amen. And it's the blood that balances the scale. So when Jesus Christ was on that cross and he laid down his life and his blood was shed, we can turn toward that and say, I believe in it. God, align my spirit up with it. It's the truth. I believe with it. And it balances our scale. And when our scale is balanced, the God of heaven can legitimately point at us and say, you are justified. And because you're justified, he can reach in and pull out his life and put it inside of us. Amen. And this is the mystery that we preach, which is Christ in you. So I'd love to hear tonight about your business, about what you do for a living, about your life, where you've traveled, what you've learned. I'd love to hear about your church experiences, the things that you had experiences with in life, the things that you learned. I'd love to know what you know about the Bible, where you studied, what you learned when you studied the Bible. But at the end of the day, what I really want to know is has God pulled out his life and put it inside of you. And just recently again, I sat in a service, the entire service, all the songs, all the preaching, everything that happened, didn't understand a word. It's all in another language. But you know, you know, when you go to some of those faces with people that you cannot communicate with, and you grab a hold of their hand and you look in their eyes and something jumps inside. And you know that the same God who put his life inside of me put it inside of them. Don't particularly know what their doctrine is. Probably wouldn't like it if I did know. <laughs> but I am concerned that God put his life in you. Amen? Because so many places that I go <clears throat> that we've gotten into as a family, you know, we've been into all my land. <sighs> into places where all these people sit there very quietly and they listen to the music and they listen to everything that's going on. But if somebody turns toward Christ and he puts his life inside of them, what do you think is the next thing that I tell them they should do? You should be baptized. And they go and get baptized as believers and the next thing I know, I'm getting messages from people saying, if you come back in this community, we're going to kill you. These are people who will not join the military. They're threatening to kill me. And I realize when that happens that there is an entire group of people sitting there clapping politely when we sing that do not understand what it means for God to pull his life out and put it inside of them.
in the Middle East, <clears throat> Christianity to them is not something you believe. It's the way you're born. True story. Muslim in the Middle East is not something you believe or something you practice. It's the way you're born. If your mom is a Muslim and your dad is a Muslim, it will be stamped right beside on that paper that has a little footprint on it, your birth certificate. It'll be stamped right beside that, Muslim. It doesn't matter what you believe. If your mom was a Catholic, your dad was a Catholic, it will be stamped right on your passport, Christian. It doesn't matter what you believe. It's a true story. It doesn't fit very well with our Western mindset, but that's the way it is in the Middle East. So if somebody tells you they're a Christian, that doesn't mean a thing. Unfortunately, it has become a lot that way in some of our world. People say they're a Christian, but I'm asking a question. You tell me you're a Christian, would you tell me that the God of heaven has pulled his life out and put it inside of your body? Because that's what God's looking for is that life. Amen? My little children, the Bible says. <coughs> John 14, 20, at that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. There's three things there he said you're going to know. One of them is that I, the red blob, am in my Father. You are in me, and I have taken a piece of that and put it down here in you. <coughs> John 14. Um, Galatians 4.19, My little children of whom I travail and birth again until Christ be formed in you, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. Of whom I travail in birth until Christ, Christ, the anointed life of God, is formed in you. We are made body and soul and spirit. God wants to put his spirit in the center of our being. Amen. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Do you know what makes God feel rich? If you used gold for black type on your driveway, what would make you feel rich? God uses gold for a blacktop on his streets. So what do you think makes him feel rich? You know what makes God feel rich? When he takes his life and he pulls it out and he puts it inside of somebody and he stands back and goes, Oh, that makes me feel rich! And then that life begins to transform the person. Amen? Amen? And fill them with love and joy and peace and victory and life. Amen? And as it turns, makes all those things happen, all those things coming out of the individual make God look good. Amen? Amen. Glory. The riches of the glory. To make no, God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. And the mystery is Christ in you. If you would, I would like to have you just bow your heads for a little bit. 
And I want to pray. God, you're good. You're right. Your ways are right. Your glory is right. Your majesty is right. Your holiness is right. And you, the God of heaven, want to put your life in us. And God, I don't know all the faces that I'm looking at here tonight, but I know that behind every face is a story. And I know that there is nothing about that story that you don't know. You know every detail of every life in this place. You know how many hair are on their head. You numbered them. So tonight, Father God, I know that you know where in this room you have put your life and where people are simply trying to go through religious motions. or where there are young people who have grown up not knowing or understanding your life. But you, the God of heaven, you want to put your life in all of us so that our life will make you look good. Forgive me, God, for the parts of my life that have not been taken over by Christ to the point that they make you look good. But God, I pray tonight in Jesus' name that you would just make clear to every person in this room if they are living their own life or if you have put your life in them. Make it clear to us, God, by your Holy Spirit, to each one of us in our own spirit. as your heads are bowed, I would just say to each one of you tonight, you will answer many questions in your life about what you believe, what you believe about this or that, what you think should happen here or there. You will never answer a more important question than this one. Has God put his life inside of you? Because on that question hangs the balance of heaven and hell. Has God put his life in you? The most important question you will ever answer. So God, I just pray you would be with us here tonight. You would follow us home. Even in the stillness of the night, you would speak deep into our spirit and help us to understand. Because Father God, every person in this room came here tonight because they want to know you. They want to serve you. They want to be yours. I want to be yours. And each one of us wants that life inside of us. And I just pray that you would open our heart and our spirit to the reality of what you want to do inside of us.
Thank you tonight, God, for this time. I just pray you make it clear to us in our hearts because you're right in Jesus' name. For as long as you live, I hope you never forget this one thing. Christianity is God taking his life and putting it in your human flesh. There are no other religions on the face of the earth that claim that their God pulls his life out and puts it inside your human flesh. There are none. That is only Christianity. And it is real Christianity. By the way, it's why it's called Christianity and not Jesusianity. Christ in you, the hope of glory. I, who am I supposed to turn it over to? Okay. Yeah. Pull out your 